Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, hi, welcome, my name's Georgia. Today I'm going to be talking about an almost solved case. Somebody is currently out on bail awaiting trial for the murder of Evelyn Colon, but this is a slow moving case. I usually tend to focus on those sort of solidly unsolved cases on my platforms, but I felt very drawn to talk about Evelyn and her story. The story of how she was unidentified for 44 years, known only as Beth Doe. How she was eventually identified, how her family searched for her for every single one of those years. Sometimes hearing how a case like this came to be solved, or almost solved I suppose, as no actual trial has taken place yet, can be a small slither of light in this very dark true crime community. Sometimes these historic cases can get solved, this one just needs a tiny little bit of a push. But before I continue to talk about Evelyn, I do just want to take a moment to talk about channel memberships. Making the kind of content that I do on YouTube and just across the internet, non-sensationalised, mostly unsolved content with no clickbait, means that you may have noticed my videos don't really get picked up by the algorithm like many others may do. Now this is a choice I made a long time ago, I feel like if I don't have my morals and my ethics in this community, then I will have lost myself. I will never sensationalise a title or a thumbnail just to get clicks, like that's just not me, I don't feel comfortable with that. I want my videos to get views, I want to continue being able to do this as a job, I feel like I'm doing a good thing by doing this. I want to be able to draw as much attention as I can to these cases, but at the end of the day, unsolved cases just don't get the clicks that solved cases do. I say all of this to point out, as some of you may have noticed, that my videos just aren't getting the views they used to anymore. Summer is always particularly rough on my channel, but the algorithm just doesn't seem to be picking up on my videos, and on top of that, a lot of my content also gets demonetized. that's just the nature of true crime. I know times are hard for everyone at the moment, and I hate sort of having to draw attention to this in a video, but if you happen to have £2.99 free a month to join my channel as a member, you'll get early access to new videos, priority comment replies, you'll get priority video requests, your name on the end card, and more. So please, if you want to, come and join our little community that we have. Or even if you can't join, you have no idea just how much sharing my channel, sharing my videos, talking about my content helps, recommending my videos to people. But anyway, I'm sorry for the side note, I'm sure this will rub people up the wrong way and I'm sure they'll let me know in the comments, but I want to continue being able to do this. I feel like I'm doing a good thing, I want to be able to help, I feel like I'm putting something positive into the world by sort of sharing these stories and I don't want to have to stop. But let's get back to the important thing here. On December 20th, 1976, a 14-year-old boy called Kenneth Jumper Jr. was playing along the banks of the Lehigh River in Whitehaven, Carbon County, Pennsylvania, when he came across a dismembered body. This was only about 250 yards from his home, he'd been running a trap line through the area, when he found a head and several other body parts lying near a rock underneath the westbound bridge of Interstate 80. Now, one article I found from the time reports that the body was taken by Kenneth Jumper Sr., the teenage boy's father, in his pickup truck to the hospital, but this seems pretty unbelievable. I don't understand why anyone would find dismembered human remains and put them in their truck to take them to hospital, rather than just simply calling the police. Nothing else I could find though suggested that this was the case, I don't know why this article says it, so we're going to assume that they did simply call the authorities as soon as possible. The scene investigators found upon arrival was pretty horrific. Alongside the dismembered body parts, they found three suitcases. All were the same size, all vinyl, two had a striped design in red, white and blue, and the other was tan with a plaid design. Alongside the remains in these cases, there was straw and packaging foam, as well as a chenille bedspread, reddish-orange in colour and embroidered with yellow and pink flowers. The bedspread was probably originally pink in colour, but it was very worn, very dirty, and changed to sort of this rust or coral colour over the years. Carol Schweitzer, a senior forensic case specialist at the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, pointed out that somebody had these items in their home. These were everyday items. The bedspread was probably on somebody's bed, so they would have been seen by people. 
Also in the suitcases, there were bits of ripped newspaper, which were later determined to be six sections of the New York Sunday News, dated September 26, 1976. So immediately they were kind of able to put some sort of timeline on this. The body parts had been wrapped in this paper. At some point after the body parts had been stuffed inside and the zipper was closed, all of the suitcases had been spray painted black and the handles had been cut off. This was premeditated, everything was thought through. I mean, why would somebody go to the lengths of spray painting a suitcase after stuffing a dismembered body inside? Well, perhaps to make it more difficult to see at the bottom of the river, which was where the suitcases were meant to go. You see, the body parts here had been put inside the three suitcases before being thrown off the westbound bridge, likely out of a vehicle that had been traveling west. It's clear that the perpetrator intended for the suitcases to land in the river down below to sort of lessen the chances of the body ever being found, but their aim was off. Two of the suitcases landed in the woods underneath, so about 20 feet from the river, and the third was found on the riverbank, and then two of them opened upon impact with the ground, having dropped 300 feet off the bridge, and so they let the contents spill out. The torso, which was cut in two halves in one case, and a head and fetus in the other. Yep, that's right, fetus. Just a number of feet away from the head of the seemingly adult woman was the body of a near full-term female fetus. The baby had never been born, she'd been ripped out of her mother's body. After careful analysis of the crime scene, the victim was transported to Naden Huetan Hospital, I hope I'm saying that right, and underwent an autopsy where it was determined that the body was that of a Caucasian woman in her late teens or early 20s. The fetus was also determined to be white, and as I said before, the pregnancy was full term. The cause of death of the woman was determined to be strangulation, however, she had been shot in the neck as well. Whoever killed her clearly wanted her dead. It was also determined at autopsy that this dismemberment was not haphazard, it was done with care, which seems like a weird thing to say, but that's what they said, and it was performed with a fine serrated tool. Now, the dismemberment wasn't quite up to surgical standards, but it certainly seemed like the killer knew what he was doing. The arms, legs and head had been severed from the body and the torso was cut in two. The ears and nose had also been cut off and they were never recovered from the scene. The ears and the nose being cut off strikes me as particularly cruel. So say you're a killer and you need to try and fit this body into these three suitcases. It kind of makes sense in this weird fucked up way that you will cut off the legs, cut the torso in two, cut off the arms. Cutting off the ears and the nose, like that is personal, that is hatred. There's no reason to do that, apart from maybe to make her less likely to be identified. But the woman did have multiple distinctive marks. She had a two to six inch scar above one of her heels. She had two moles on her face above her left eye and on her left cheek, but they may have formed during pregnancy. At some point before she became a teenager, she'd had some femolas extracted and she also had fillings. Despite the previous dental care, it seemed like she hadn't actually seen a dentist though in quite some time and her teeth were very badly decayed. One of her front incisors also had a fracture which likely caused severe tooth pain and it also would have been very noticeable to others. The medical examiner also noted that a note had been written on the palm of Beth Doe's, as she came to be known, left hand. The letters WSR and the number 4 or 5 followed by another 4 or 7. If the victim wrote this note herself, and she most likely did, like everyone just writes notes on their palms, then she would have been right-handed. Immediately, they set to work identifying the woman. I don't think anyone suspected that she would remain nameless for 44 years, as she'd eventually come to be known, as I said, as Beth Doe. Her fingerprints were sent to the FBI, but they found no matches in their system. They released a sketch of her to the public. They published information about the case through the media, but very few solid leads came in. Quite quickly, the case went cold. There was no identity of Beth, nor of her killer. And that's where the case sat for many, many decades. There wasn't much more they could do than that. They did search, nothing came forward. 
But then tech got better. In 2007, Beth Doe was exhumed from the Cattaraugus Cemetery where she'd been laid to rest decades earlier, as she was transported to the University of Texas Center for Human Identification in Fort Worth, so they could make the most of these latest technologies. At this point, they were able to develop a DNA profile, which was entered into an international database to no avail, no matches. Now, at this point in time, familial genetic genealogy wasn't really a thing, at least not like it is today. So what they were searching for here was an exact match. They were relying on the fact that her family or other loved ones may have reported Beth Doe as missing and entered her DNA into the database just in case. But that hadn't happened. At the time of her discovery, Beth Doe was thought to be Caucasian, although tanned Caucasian. An article in the Pocono Record, published just eight days after her discovery, stated that people thought she may have been sort of Spanish or Italian, or maybe just sort of generally Mediterranean. But isotope testing around 2007 also revealed some interesting information. But isotope testing went on to reveal some more interesting information. Now, isotope testing consists of testing isotopes obviously found in the body. Usually by testing the hair and the teeth, it allows experts to create this sort of map of somebody's history. Water, food, soil is different all around the world. And in theory, that should be able to provide a clue as to where someone grew up or spent periods of their life. Your hair is basically a history of where you've spent time. The food you're consuming sort of affects your hair's DNA. I don't really know the details of it, but you get what I'm trying to say. Like in theory, with isotope testing, a single strand of your hair will provide a map of your history. The longest part, the bottom part, showing where you were three, four, five years ago, depending on how long your hair is. The newest bit is the very top of your head, showing where you were recently. Isotope testing in Beth Doe's case suggested that she'd been born and spent her early childhood in Western or Central Europe before moving to the United States as a teenager. She likely became pregnant in the US and she was living in the Southeast at the time. They even went as specific as saying Eastern Tennessee. This is probably a lesson in not taking these things as gospel. This science, isotope testing, is relatively new and it still isn't perfect because it would turn out that this wasn't Beth Doe's story at all. In May 2015, the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children released two new reconstructions of Beth Doe, hoping that someone who recognised her would come forward. And people did come forward, but to no avail. Over the course of this investigation, 12 missing women have been considered and then dismissed as possible identities for Beth. Now this obviously doesn't help identify her, but it does strike one unidentified person off the list for the people who are searching for their loved ones. They're one step closer to finding their person. In 2019, a tip was sent into the police by somebody who attended a school with a girl called Maggie Cruz. She'd noticed a resemblance between her and reconstructions of Beth Doe. At 16 years old in 1974, Maggie had run away with her foster sister, and two years later she called a friend claiming she was pregnant and needed money. After this point, nobody heard from her again. When this tip came in, police investigated it thoroughly, straight to the end, and found that Maggie Cruz was actually alive and well. So this wasn't an answer as to Beth, but it was an answer to the people worrying and wondering about Maggie. Whilst this intense search for Beth's identity and killer is happening over the years, there's a family out there desperately searching for their loved one, Evelyn Colon. Evelyn disappeared in 1976 from New Jersey after falling pregnant with her boyfriend and moving in with him. One day, her mum went round to visit her at the apartment and found that they'd moved, leaving no forwarding address. The apartment was completely empty. And they never heard from her again, although they spent years wondering what on earth had happened. That was until Luis Colon Jr., who would have been Evelyn's nephew, submitted his DNA to genetic genealogy company 23andMe. Now, he actually went through multiple of these companies purely in the hope of connecting with his long-lost aunt. She was kind of a story that the family always told, the missing aunt, Evelyn. Now, he never thought that Evelyn could be dead, a homicide victim. The whole family always thought she just decided to leave. It never crossed their minds that something awful happened. 
He said to CNN in 2021, about four years ago, I heard about the DNA stuff and I wanted to see, hey, this could be an awesome tool if I could connect with family and specifically connect with my cousin because I knew she, Evelyn, had a kid or cousins, multiple children or her. So I got the kits, purchased one for me, for my wife, ordered another one from another website because I felt like the more sites I'm on, the more chance that something would come out of it. Unbeknownst to Louise, just the year before, in 2020, the Pennsylvania State Police had started to work with the National Center for Missed and Exploited Children to leverage advanced DNA testing that could lead to Beth Doe's identity. They then engaged DNA Labs International to produce a DNA extract from the unidentified remains, and in November 2020, this extract was sent to Othram. Othram were able to use their tech to produce a genealogical profile for Beth Doe. In February 2021, they then returned this profile to the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children and DNA Labs International, who were very quickly able to identify a very close DNA match, her nephew, Luis Colon Jr. They contacted Luis and upon speaking to him, discovered that his father's sister, Evelyn Colon, hadn't been heard from since the mid-1970s. And just like that, they had Beth Doe's identity. Again, Louise said to CNN, I get notified that, hey, your DNA was matched to a victim of a homicide. So we got in touch and they asked me, do you know anyone in your family? And I immediately, once they reached out to me, I knew it was her. It was obvious there was no other person in my family who was missing. And that's when the ball started rolling. Evelyn Colon was 15 years old when she died. She was Puerto Rican, but she'd lived in New Jersey with her parents and four siblings. She was not Caucasian, and friends and family say that the reconstruction photos look nothing like her. No wonder she wasn't recognised. And unfortunately, the family have next to no photos of Evelyn due to a house fire in 1975 that destroyed a lot of their very cherished memories. Evelyn got pregnant in 1976, age 15, with her then 19-year-old boyfriend, Luis Sierra, who was a neighbour of the families. As you can imagine, this was a bit of a scandal at the time. You've got to remember that this was the 1970s. Society reacted completely different to these things back then than they do now. At 15 years old, Evelyn was expected to move out of her family home to live with Louise to raise the child together. I don't know the legalities around this at the time. It would be illegal now. I don't know if it would have been in the 1970s, but this is just what happened. It was the done thing. So the pair moved in together to an apartment on Tunnel Avenue in Jersey City, but Evelyn remained in close contact with her family. One day in mid-December 1976, Evelyn called her mother and said that she wasn't feeling well. She requested her mum's homemade soup. When in doubt, mum's cooking is always going to solve everything. Now, I'm not sure if it was the same day or days later, sources aren't very clear, but when her brother Luis, not her boyfriend Luis, it gets quite confusing, and their mum turned up at the apartment with the soup, they found it was empty. The couple had moved on, or so they thought. The family had no reason to think that something bad had happened, so they didn't immediately report Evelyn as missing. But then, in January 1977, they received a letter that was allegedly from Evelyn. It was stamped in Connecticut and did have a return address on it, but it was completely illegible. The letter was written entirely in Spanish and stated that the couple had moved to Connecticut. Evelyn had given birth, both her and the baby were doing very well. Apparently, they'd had a baby boy named Luis Sierra Jr. weighing nine pounds and said that if she ever needed anything, she'd be in touch with them. But this letter was strange, you see, because Evelyn didn't write. She did not, she could not have written this letter. The family assumed that her boyfriend, Luis Sierra, had been the one to write it, but that didn't immediately sort of send alarm bells ringing. After receiving this letter though, the family did attempt to go to the police. They just wanted to find Evelyn. They didn't think necessarily something bad had happened to her, but nobody paid them much mind, especially after they found out about the letter. Teenagers were allowed to go missing. Evelyn was a mum now. She was with her boyfriend. She wanted to live her own life. Leave her be was pretty much the message from the police. The family tried to report her as missing, but the police just really didn't do anything at all. And I'm sure there was a language barrier there as well. There was nothing more her family could do, so they just waited for Evelyn to get in contact. Only, of course, she never did. 
The family always believed the letter was true. Although they knew that Evelyn couldn't have written it, they assumed that Louise had under her instruction and the contents wasn't a lie. They just always believed that she just moved on. They never assumed that something bad had happened to her. Perhaps that was an easier way to live. But they never, ever stopped searching. Apparently for years, the mother would see Evelyn everywhere they went. She'd go out just wandering around Jersey City, just searching for her daughter. She never understood why she couldn't find her and she felt guilty. She wondered if she'd done something to drive her daughter away. She thought it was all her fault. Her dying wish was for her family to find Evelyn, a wish that has now been granted thanks to genetic genealogy, thanks to her family taking her request seriously. They searched for Evelyn for years and they found her, even though it wasn't quite the ending that they'd hoped for. It didn't take long after the discovery of Evelyn's identity for investigators to turn to Louis Sierra to question him. I mean, he was her partner at the time she disappeared. He was the last person she was known to be with. He never reported her as missing when she suddenly disappeared. Investigators conducted multiple interviews with Sierra, finding that his story changed each time. At first, he denied that he ever even knew Evelyn, although he did later admit that he did date her and knew that she was pregnant with his child, but he insists that the last time he saw her was at their Jersey City apartment. He said he left for work in the morning and returned home to an empty apartment. Other versions of the story are that they parted ways due to an argument before the baby was born, he never met the baby. But when she did go missing, he made no effort to search for her or their unborn child. But after intense questioning, Sierra did admit that it was possible he may have written the January 1977 letter to Evelyn's family, conceding that he didn't remember writing it, but he may well have done so. He also conceded that he may have named the baby Louis Sierra Jr. had it been a boy, as he wrote in the letter. But as we know, the baby was a girl. An old school friend of Evelyn's, Elaine Caruso, said, Everybody knew it was her boyfriend. He would just stand there by his car and watch her. I just wondered, wondered and wondered for years where she was. I first thought when we didn't see her in high school that she ran off, got married. But then we knew her family was looking for her back then. We knew something was wrong. And it seems like the police agreed because in March 2021, Louis Sierra, now aged 63, was arrested in Ozone Park in Queens in New York. He first appeared in court on account of homicide on April 28th, 2021. The judge ruled at that point that there was enough evidence to send the case to county court, while Sierra's defense attorney, Robert Madden, argued that the charges should be dismissed because of the lack of physical or forensic evidence linking his client to the crime. But according to state police, Sierra was the last person to see her alive. They also say he was the one to send the letter, although that letter has since been lost. It can't be used as evidence because it no longer exists. As the case currently stands, Sierra is awaiting trial, but in July 2022, he was released on bail. Louise Colon, Evelyn's brother, says that he woke up to a text from a Pennsylvania state police trooper that recent changes in Pennsylvania bail law required a bail amount to be set for any crime, which it was for $250,000, and Sierra was able to post bail. He was originally held without bail due to the nature of his charges, but the new law just changed that he was allowed to be out. As of August 2023, there hasn't really been any more news as to when the trial is, if a date's even been set. Please remember in this case that an arrest doesn't mean guilt. Sierra has been charged with homicide, but he hasn't been found guilty of the charges against him. At this point in time, any accusations against him are alleged. Honestly, I'm not sure he's going to get prosecuted based on the singular evidence that Sierra was the last person known to be with Evelyn. I am assuming and hoping that there's more evidence here that's being kept back from the public and there is a big chance that that is the case. Maybe they have something forensic. But as it's been pointed out by Sierra's defense lawyer, what is stopping investigators from looking at other potential suspects? Evelyn may have left the home after an argument, as Sierra said, and she may have been picked up by someone else. I'm not saying that's 100% what happened, I'm not saying that's what I believe, but you have got to look at every possibility in this case. I just really, really hope they've got enough evidence in this case so true justice can be served. I'm hoping they've got more evidence that they're just holding back. 
Evelyn would have turned 62 years old in April this year and back in 2021 her family actually started a GoFundMe to help pay for a memorial service to give Evelyn a proper goodbye. In the decades since, a large portion of the family had moved back to Puerto Rico, so travel was very expensive. It was hard to get everyone back in one place. They also finally gave Evelyn's daughter a name, Emily Grace. Evelyn's sisters said that from conversations they had while she was pregnant, they believed Emily was going to be the name that she chose if she had a girl, and they chose Grace as a middle name, representing the grace of God. Whilst this outcome isn't what the Cologne family expected when they embarked on this search for their sister, for their aunt, they have now got peace, they've got an answer, even if it wasn't the one they wanted. They finally know that Evelyn didn't purposefully leave them, that they didn't do anything wrong, that they have no guilt, and that's really good to know. So now it's just a case of waiting, we wait for the trial and we see what happens. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you for choosing to spend this time with me and with Evelyn. I'm gonna be keeping a very close eye on this case going forward. There hasn't been any news in this now for over a year. So I'm hoping, assuming maybe that soon they will release a trial date for this, but the justice system is really slow. Like this could take years. Before you click off this video, please make sure that you interact with it in some sort of way. Give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below, share it with somebody, just something to try and help my channel. It would be greatly, greatly appreciated. I genuinely cannot do this job without you guys. This is very much a two-way street. Being a YouTuber, there is only so much you can do to make YouTube want to promote your videos. A lot of it does sort of sit in the hand of the viewers. It sits in the hand of people interacting with the content. So you have no idea how much I appreciate it. If you will, just do something, just anything. Again, thank you, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, guys.